when you're talking about eating insects, we need to back things up just a little bit. So let's talk about why eating insects is actually a good idea, and then I'll get to whether we could fully sustain ourselves on just insects. The good, the bad, and the science. comedians and scientists. The good, the bad, and the science. Welcome to The Good, the Bad, and the Science, the show that breaks down the science of television and movies with a comedian and a scientist. Today we're discussing Snowpiercer. So I'll ask about climate change, eating bugs, and freezing your limbs off. Hi everyone, I'm your host Ethan Enberg and I've got two wonderful guests joining me today. My first guest is a comic based in San Francisco, although he just told me he is moving to LA. Welcome to the show, Murad Shaki. Hello, thank you for this very weird film. <laughs> You're, I did not make it, but you are welcome uh, <laughs> oh, for, I guess, okay. bringing it into your life. So this is the first time you've seen it, is that correct? No, I'd seen it, I'd seen it before because I, I really like the director Bong Joon-ho. And I remembered it being really weird, uh, but I, I, I guess my memory got real foggy because, man, that was a trip seeing that a second time. Uh, yeah. And also, I thought that movie came out in, in my head. It came out in like 2016. I saw the year it came out. It came out in 2013. And that was like I know. a nice little panic attack I had at the beginning of the movie. Yeah, yeah. This yeah. happens to me all the time, actually, going back and watching these movies. And I'm like, oh, yeah, this movie, this is a pretty recent movie. This must have came out like a year or two ago. And then I look and it's like 2008. <laughs> it's like whoa what the hell happened between then and now um so before i introduce the next guest i wanted to ask you since this movie is about a train ride that never ends if you've been on any sort of long train ride yeah uh i took an amtrak from st louis to chicago uh okay. and it was really just a game of how much can we uh underage young adults uh drink publicly on this train how do we do it do we put the <laughs> do we put the flask in the sleeve and then tilt but why are you tilting up a whole sleeve to drink that's not really low-key that's not very subtle. and then we found out uh if you if people just won't talk to you though you can just drink <laughs> you can just normally drink and no <laughs> yeah, one cares because yeah, yeah, it's yeah, a train yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay so, that's awesome yeah. so you are pro uh extended train rides you're down with it yeah, yeah. Uh, I hope they get that Hyperloop. What is it called? That thing from like SF to LA that they're making or supposedly yeah. going to make. I, I would, I would be a day one train rider. Yeah, absolutely. So would I. I don't know what that's called. I feel like it's been rumored for a decade or so, but I really hope they pull it off because supposedly it'll it'll get us between me and where you are in like an hour or something. Um, so our second guest, I'm, I'm thrilled to talk to. He is an entomologist and founder and director of the Ramsey Research Foundation. It's Dr. Sammy Ramsey. Hey there. What's up, Dr. Sammy? Uh, you know, the typical stuff, just running around catching bugs before I got here. <laughs> Was that actually what you were doing this morning? It's literally what I've been doing since 8 a.m. <laughs> Pulling okay, parasites so off wait. of honeybees mostly. You're taking parasites off of honeybees. Mm -hmm. Yep. What kind of parasites are on honeybees? Are they are they uh, damaging them? Or are they killing them? Oh, they're definitely damaging them. They're definitely killing them. I, the the name for this parasite is going to sound a bit melodramatic, so hold back the laughter. But it is called Varroa okay. destructor, and it's pretty oh, awesome. Damn, God, yeah. <laughs> sounds like a Godzilla villain, <laughs> doesn't it? Though, yeah, doesn't it? Though. Or, or like a great monster truck, like an awesome monster truck. <laughs> Ladies Gorilla and gentlemen, Gorilla Destructor. <laughs> yeah, it absolutely does. That's a really cool name, and it sounds devastating. Is it? Oh, it is, is it as dangerous as it sounds? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, so imagine a parasite that proportionally is the size of your hand, uh, crawls onto your body, uh, and sticks its mouth parts into you, liquefies your liver, and then sucks it out of your body. You know problematic Whoa. yeah I, I, if i could just say um no offense and i really respect your your trade i fucking hate bugs that <laughs> sounds like a nightmare i fucking hate bugs so much i also think it's amazing that this movie that's about this complex it's like it's like this moral play about like how to maintain an ecosystem mm -hmm. and it's got all these different moving parts and it's like about also like perpetual motion and yes. like making this eternally sustain and we're just fucking focusing on the bugs let's we talk to you know, bugs. Yucky we need little to. Guys. <laughs> and you know what i appreciate that you're here because you're gonna bring a level of balance to this perspective i'm yeah, gonna be the exactly. 
bridled, <laughs> excited, optimistic. Yeah, we should all be eating bugs. This is going to be great. And you're going to be like, oh, oh, bro. Oh, nah. Son, this is not. Mm-mm. That ain't it, fam. That ain't it. Do you, have a, do you have a favorite bug snack? Have you eaten bugs? Oh, favorite bug snack. When I was an undergraduate, uh, we had this big... Uh, insect eating extravaganza for the last day of class for my intro uh, insect bio course and somebody made um it was banana nut muffins but instead of nuts they were mealworms and it was amazing wow so it didn't weird you out at all that they were in there no no it did not um after you've read about them as much as i've read about them you've learned about them and you don't have the perception that a lot of people bring to it that they're ew they're dirty they crawl around in the dust like when you get past those elements of it it's hard to find them disgusting as a a food product especially considering the rest of the stuff that we eat i mean how hypocritical would i be not being willing to eat some mealworms when we eat shrimp um, we eat lobsters, we eat crabs, mm-hmm. all of which That's are the true. bugs of the sea. Yeah, I shrimp literally have lines of poop that you can see yeah. on them. You can see and everybody's it down with it for body. some reason. Um, okay, I mean, I already have so many questions for you. I mean, number one, I wanted to ask about the, the bees because, I mean, obviously this parasite sounds horrible, <laughs> but we were all kind of up in arms last year about the murder hornets. Is mm-hmm. there an update on those giant Asian hornets that were killing bees? There are actually some great updates about that. So they are still localized to just the Pacific Northwest. We have not found them anywhere but that region of North America. So a little bit of Canada, a little bit of Washington State. And so Mm. the Washington State Department of Agriculture, in addition to the United States Department of Agriculture, there's been a partnership to keep them Uh, confined while we eradicate the population that has shown up there. So uh, to date, multiple, uh, I think three nests at this point, one, two, three, yep, yep, three nests at this point have been destroyed, uh, which is great. Um, Our hope is that there are no more but it is possible that there are still others. And so work is underway to make sure that any of the population that landed here is destroyed. But also, uh, I'm conducting a project uh, overseas. So I'll be heading to Southeast Asia again soon and doing some collecting of the hornets there because we need to know where our population of hornets came from. So one of the best things that we can do is conduct genetic analysis of the entire distribution of Asian giant hornets to see, okay, so where do they come from and how best can we manage making sure that we don't end up accidentally introducing more of them? Wow. Okay. Uh, well, hats off to you. Hats off to the teams that are killing those nests. That's awesome. Oh, yeah. um, are you are you afraid at all about going over there and trying to catch these hornets yourself? I, I mean, I was told that they are quite uh, they're quite dangerous. They can they can hurt people. Look, let me tell you something. <laughs> <laughs> Please. You, oof. So I was working in Thailand uh, around the time that all of this hullabaloo about the hornets got started. Uh, And so as a result of the pandemic, I had to take this emergency flight home. It took eight different planes for me to finally get back to the U.S. because everything was getting shut down because of the pandemic. Finally got back and I thought like everybody else, oh, it'll just be a few weeks, maybe a couple of months I can head back to Thailand and finish my work. So all of my colonies were still dispersed in the environment. I had 48 colonies at the time. I was like, okay, everything's going to be fine. The pandemic dragged on, and just a few months into the pandemic, not even three whole months into the pandemic, I spoke with one of my colleagues who told me that nearly every single one of my colonies had been cleaned out by Asian hornets. I was like, okay, all right, that's Ooh, fine. Wow. That's cool. So you're Ooh. out for revenge. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, at, at this point, it is a cautionary tale to us. If we sit here and don't do something about this potential invasive species scenario, we could end up in a similar situation where in the long list of issues that our bees already have to deal with, then we also have to deal with hornets flying into the colonies, cleaning out all the babies, turning them into meatballs, and taking them home to be devoured by their own offspring. It's pretty messed up. Yeah, that sounds super messed up. I mm-hmm. mean, what about just like preserving the these bee colonies? I mean, do we have ways of, you know, can, are you are you building biodomes for bees where they can safely habitate? 
Thankfully, some of this work has been done already. So in Japan, where these hornets are a consistent feature in the environment, researchers there have created traps that can be attached to the front of the colonies such that when the hornets try to get inside, they get stuck in this one-way opening sort of trap. And it has a remarkable success rate in protecting colonies from those hornets. So that would be great Whoa. to attach. One of the reasons why you're not hearing much about that now is because we have not yet had a bunch of issues with these hornets cleaning out honeybee it's colonies. big hornet. Big hornets covering it all up, man. Wake up, sheeple. Big hornet. Big hun <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. All right. You, you know what? He makes a point. He makes a point. <laughs> I mean, this is going to be on the internet. This is going to be on YouTube, right? So it's going to be ripe for conspiracy theories to just take over and shut things down. Yeah, and we're starting them. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. I'm not going to stand here and let Big Hornet take over. Absolutely right. not. I can tell you this right now: the USDA is not going to be happy about me being involved with the starting of any conspiracy theories. So I'd like to say right now, I have nothing to do with any of this Big Hornet stuff. <laughs> well, I just have one question on that, just because it's like going to stick in my mind as we discuss other oh, yeah. stuff if I don't ask it. So this like one way trap thing why mm -hmm. doesn't it trap the bees i'm seeing it like mm -hmm. when you go to park your car and you mm -hmm. drive over those spikes yep and you can't back up so what why why do hornets get trapped but bees don't see i, I see why you're the host of this show you just on the fly pop up with great questions ethan well done oh, so <laughs> all right so these bees, ha, on the fly. I thought it because no one else wanted to do it. <laughs> well, you know, I don't know the internal workings of this, but but it, it made sense to me. So these, okay, thank you. the bees are substantially smaller than the hornets. The hornets are huge by comparison. And so okay. because the bees are smaller, they can easily get out of that opening if they go into it. So that's not an issue for them. Uh, the bees also have... Uh, they're, they're going to be less attracted to the, the sorts of baits that we would use for the hornets than the bees. So there are okay. fermented baits that are often used uh, for the hornets. The hornets can actually get drunk off of, mind you. Um, but Whoa. yeah, yeah. Okay, so kind of like uh, Murat on those on those trains. Uh, ha, ha. <laughs> hornets are <laughs> yeah. getting hornets are getting wasted. Uh, unfortunately, also killed. Yes, but, uh, yes, yes. Or trapped. Or like Yona um, in Snowpiercer. <laughs> Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, there you put a bunch of what was it, Cronal, and right. uh, you can get a bunch of <laughs> bunch of hornets to come running. Um, okay, so obviously, and you're doing a great job, Sammy, trying to segue us into this movie. But I'm still not ready to hop on board the Snowpiercer <laughs> yet because I also read that you love cicadas. Oh my gosh. and man, from the... <laughs> cicadas are the devil's bug. I oh my gosh. I grew up in the Bay Area. I never got the me the memo on cicadas, and then I went to school in Missouri, and I came out during some. I my first summer there was some like mating season shit. It was like, oh, this is why people are religious. I would believe <laughs> in the devil and plagues because I accidentally kicked a, I, what I thought was a dead one, and it was like I set off a frag grenade. I yeah. they're. <laughs> Awful bugs. So <laughs> they're not um, even gross looking. They look mean. They look angry. <laughs> this is I'm sorry. This is unofficially a debate show. This is like crossfire now. <laughs> so uh, let's let's consider. So so let's 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 just break down what you just said to me for a moment. You kicked the bug, but you it was are an accident. Upset. It was an accident, right? It was an right, accident, right? Okay. But 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 he or she is not aware that that was an accident. So you kicked that bug, and then yeah. the bug let out this weird ear-piercing noise that you heard. Just... The, to, to, the, to how it. fast it moved was, right? the, was the awful part. <laughs> and it, it was just trying to declare to you, hey, bruh, back off. I mean you no harm. Don't mess with me. Don't start nothing. <laughs> Won't, be Won't be nothing. nothing. <laughs> and the problem is, like, you know, the, there's there, there rarely is a translator available for you. Now, I do. I, I, I'm willing to even donate my services as a cicada translator. I've done it before. Uh, you wow. can see on YouTube if you Google uh, cicada song, Big Red Eyes. It's all me. I had to translate the, what the cicadas are singing uh, so that y'all could better understand what's happening in these treetops. Now, what you got to understand about these bugs is they came here for love. They're not worried about you. They're not interested in you. They've been underground for, for many of uh, these, these species. They've been underground for seven 
18 years. All they've been thinking about is, when I get out of here, ooh, I'm going to find her and we're going to get down. It is going <laughs> to be an experience. This is going to be a love for the ages. So when they climb up that tree and they start shaking their rear end, creating this weird noise that is unlike anything in this world, all they are doing is releasing a love song to the world to attempt to attract the mate that they've been thinking about for nearly two decades. So, damn. I mean, man, I'm it trying would to suck be a... if, like, after all that time, the sex was bad. Yeah, <laughs> it was yeah. like a bad lay. <laughs> I mean, sure. not even. Now, and, and that happens more often than you think because there's a fungus uh, and there, <laughs> it's, it is the worst sexually transmitted disease you could probably ever get. The fungus creeps into their bodies after they have been with somebody who's infected and actually causes their butt and genitals to fall off, uh, which is oh replaced by a giant bulb of fungal hyphae. And so as the cicadas fly around, they're just shaking out all of these spores onto the cicadas around them. And then it changes their behavior such that they become hypersexual, even though they don't have sexual organs anymore. So they're just shaking that rear end around, trying to attract males to come over and mate with them. Uh, regardless of the fact that these are males trying to attract the other males in this system, it just, everything gets really, really, really wild. And it's doing that so it can spread to more, right? Yep. Like, yeah. yeah. Okay. Wow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How God. did that, how does it, how do you contract that in the first place? And by you, I mean a cicada. Yeah. So if you've, so this, if you've been with a, if a, like a loose harlot cicada. Like. I mean, look, <laughs> so one of the problems here is as much as I talk about love with the cicadas, they're not particularly finicky. Uh, the males at least are not particularly finicky about who they end up with. And so you end up in scenarios where they, this, this gentleman's been underground for long enough that when he gets above ground, he wants to do as much loving as he can before uh, his short life is over. And that unfortunately favors sexually transmitted diseases. Oh my God. I mean, it does make sense though. Mm -hmm. Like I'm trying to see it from the, from their perspective. Like if you're underground for 17 years, you're probably a psycho. Yeah. A little bit. Like your brain yeah. kind of melts. You're full incel after that. Like, right, you're exactly. <laughs> I prefer to think of them as hyper focused rather than psychos. They've got one thing on their mind. They have a lot of problematic political views. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's why cicadas don't have Twitter. No, why do why what are they doing for 17 years in the ground? I mean, that sounds incredibly uncommon, right? I mean, that's not a normal thing for for bugs. Is that a derogatory no. term? Should I say insects also? See, this is one of the I, I love that you asked that question. Okay. This is one of the few circumstances where you are correct to say bugs. If we we're still talking oh. about hornets, definitely not bugs. Bugs are a subset of insects. So first of all, anyone who's ever called a spider a bug is incorrect. You have to be an insect first and spiders are arachnids. And then mm. within the group of insects, there is one group, the hemipterans. These are the insects that have a stylet as a mouth part it is a long spear like tube that they can Gross. stab into plants to pull fluid out of them or stab into other organisms or other right. um, insects, animals and things uh, to pull fluid out of them. So it's kind of their defining quality. And if you don't exist within that stretch of, of of creatures you are not a bug now cicadas do have a stylet for a mouth part and this is a great segue into the question you asked uh, most previously to that one which is what are they doing underground for yeah. 17 years well it's a it, it's a lifestyle that doesn't involve a lot of physical exercise they stick their mouth parts into oftentimes one root for the entirety of their 17 years and they will feed from that root as fluid, as they're extracting fluid from under negative pressure. They're pulling this very, very, very nutrient poor fluid out of the roots. It's mostly just water with a few dissolved ions and nutrients in it. And they're feeding on that. So that means that they're going to grow very slowly because there's not a substantial amount of nutrients going into their diet. This allows them to grow really, really, really slowly, but also not to have to do much in the way of movement or activity. Wow. And then how long are they alive once they're above ground? <laughs> That's the saddest part in this process. Uh, oh, usually two it. to four weeks. So oh my God. If you can think about the fact that they've been down there for 17 years thinking about this one party that they're going to have that's only going to last a, a, a few weeks, it's kind of upsetting. 
But what I've been trying to, to help people understand, like you, you said, they're, they're, they're pretty much psychos when they come out of the ground. Well, uh, let's, let's think of them a bit more like what we've been through. So we had this whole pandemic situation where we were stuck inside for an entire year. And then we finally get to see the rest of the world again. And so, yeah, we can be a little bit weird. We can be kind of wild. We can be hyper-focused. A lot of strange things happened right on the other end of those lockdowns. But I hope that it helped us connect a bit more with our, our subterranean buddies. Yeah, they spent those 17 years, like, really working on themselves, getting into, like, <laughs> baking breads and... <laughs> You know, yeah, okay. I like them a bit more now. Yeah, <laughs> they finally wrote that book. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> that screenplay. My play. Life Underground. Snowpiercer too. <laughs> okay, so well, I guess that that finally, I, I, again, you're you're really establishing yourself as a proper co-host here, Sammy, because you've segued <laughs> us again. I'm gonna actually follow you this time and and talk about Snowpiercer, uh, a movie that I love, but but who cares what I think? Do Dr. Sammy, was this your first time watching the movie? Uh, what did you think of it, etc.? So this was not actually my first time watching the movie. I started the movie more than a year ago and okay. yeah, and didn't actually finish it. Um, yeah, right, right. So I was, I was watching the movie with my boyfriend and it was like kind of late on a Saturday. Uh, Tilda Swinton shows up and he loves Tilda Swinton, but he did not enjoy her performance. That, that whole conversation <laughs> really? about like, what you are a shoe. I am a hat. He was not digging it. He's not like, down. Sammy. She didn't, he didn't like uh, uh, Tilda Swinton as Austin Powers. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. And the part where she removes her teeth, just the... For no apparent reason. There's like it, it. This movie is so weird. I really like um, South Korean films. Like Same. they're just so crazy experimental mm -hmm. and like yeah. really like ambitious and big yeah. picture. Like, and they really take a lot of risks. The jumps from harrowing, yeah. awful trauma yeah. to just the weirdest silliness mm -hmm. was like mm -hmm. the most like roller coaster. It was like in the middle of that train fight. That train fight is like a like a third of the movie, that train <laughs> fight. And just in the middle of it, in the night vision part, they're just doing like this weird physical comedy. Yeah. <laughs> they're just like, <laughs> yeah. There were a f there were several parts actually that stuck out to me as comedic like and and it was oddly placed there was a new year's celebration at one point where yeah. they're about to start <laughs> killing each other yeah. but they all stopped to celebrate new years it yeah. seems and then uh edgar kind of his right curtis's right hand man <laughs> makes a joke and says like oh i hate new years i hate getting older yeah when it's like who would be you thinking about that right now <laughs> half the people in your life die yeah. <laughs> right? and you're being and, and sarcastic he says this yeah. right before his opportunities to ever get older again are totally snuffed out. Like we right. can't even talk yeah. about Edgar right now. I got I got some feelings. I was I, I didn't want to see him <laughs> go out up. like that. I didn't want to see him go out like that. It hurt me to my heart. But this this movie is a Korean produced English adaptation of a French graphic novel wow. led by Chris Evans, Octavia Spencer, yes! Ed Harris. <laughs> it's like the I have never seen like I remember when I saw Snowpiercer. I was like. That wasn't like a perfect movie, but I've really never seen anything like this. And watching mm -hmm. it, I guess, eight years later, I'm like, I still haven't seen anything like Snowpiercer. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah, yeah, it's very unique um, and, and unique to the director. I would I would say Bong Joon-ho, like he has a style for sure. And I love how he, he kind of just in your face he is about the the messaging uh, in this movie like that that scene you were talking about is so on the nose where Tilda Swinton is saying you guys are the shoe <laughs> keep your place stay in your place I am the rich person I am better than you that's how it is well if I can spoil another movie that shared uh like uh the lead I think the lead in that was also in this he played the uh the Korean like like dude opening all the gates uh Song mm -hmm. Kang Ho mm. um he he was in um What's that new one? Parasite. Parasite. Yep. And Parasite, yeah. if I can like, spoil that, like no subtlety yes. whatsoever of like the working class living underground totally. and like the rich people holding their noses. I don't really think subtlety is this dude's game, but like it's no. kind of refreshing. I kind of exactly. like when somebody yeah. just tells you something. You know what exactly. I mean? Right. You don't have to exactly. go searching for it. But yeah, I Same, love but, but he still, he, he does throw in things that are 
either symbolic or seemingly symbol. Like there's a scene with the fish where they're about to fight with those axes and then they, they cut open this fish and there's no explanation about it. There's no, they don't tell you really why they're doing it or anything. Nope. It's just kind of there and then gone. So yep. I like how he, he kind of peppers in these moments where you're like, wait a minute, what the hell's going on with that? What happened right there? Oh, okay. It doesn't matter. Uh, action sequence. Uh, c- can I ask a bug question? Love that. So those those bug bars that they're eating these protein <laughs> bars and it's cl- it's you find out it's just all bugs mm-hmm. yep. uh, and that's why Sammy's here. <laughs> yep. uh, uh, can you make a bug bar that is like nutritious enough to be your only source of sustenance? Like it, it has all the minerals and vitamins and everything you need. That is a stellar question. When you're talking about eating insects. We need to back things up just a little bit. So let's talk about why eating insects is actually a good idea. And then I'll get to whether we could fully sustain ourselves on just insects. So eating insects is an incredible way for us to avoid a couple of problems that we're dealing with. One, climate change is being driven quite heavily by our land use practices that are also connected to how the organisms that we are feeding on that land are releasing huge amounts of methane, which is a very potent greenhouse gas. So what can we do about that? We could find organisms that can be raised on a much smaller amount of land and organisms that are much better at processing the food that they consume. So cows are not efficient processors of the food that they consume. It takes a lot of grass to get a a cow to the size where it can produce milk or become a cheeseburger. Uh, But crickets, oh my gosh, they are six times more efficient at processing the food that they consume than cows. So you could rear a ridiculous amount of crickets on the same amount of land for one cow. And that, like the amount of food that you could produce, uh, the number of people that you could actually feed, you would think that with organisms being this small as crickets, like it just wouldn't work out, but you can squish them into a bar or something and you've got plenty of protein. It's also very high quality protein, which is one of the reasons that people have tried to turn them into protein supplement powders uh, that haven't quite caught on as much as they could, but I'm hoping that they will at some point instead of all the, I mean, we've got so many options now. We got whey powder and all this other stuff. How about some good old cricket powder? But um, the, the, the problem with thinking of insects as the holistic way to solve all problems is that they're not going to provide you with the entirety of your nutritive needs. Uh, There is pretty much no food that's going to give you everything you could possibly need. Um, There are so many different uh, vitamins and minerals that are essential to us that we have to get from the foods that we consume. Uh, And and you're just not gonna get it all from even uh, a bar of, of, of multiple different kinds of insects. It's the reason why diverse diets are so important. Well, yeah, pr- I think you nailed it, though. I mean, protein is like the main factor. That's what everybody's selling, everybody's buying. Mm-hmm. Is all these, you know, yeah, pea proteins. All there's so many different kinds now that are leading the market. And I was reading that wasps, bees, and ants are also really protein rich. So I would love to know if that's true, if that's being worked on, and why we are, you know, squeamish about it. What's what's our big deal as humanity? Why are we anti bug protein? So that sound that you just heard me make, that is my ooh racism alert sound. It's about to show up right here real quick for you. Hey, so um, wish I had a sound cue for that. Yeah, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, anytime you hear me, and uh, there are a lot of other um, uh, people of of my level of melanin. Uh, sometimes you just hear a um, okay, <laughs> and so it's just to let you know you you about to get something heavy coming up next. Um. <laughs> So insects are incredible organisms on par with all the other stuff that we eat. The cows, the chickens. As a matter of fact, uh, in terms of the most uh, economically important livestock in North America, uh, it goes cows, pigs, and bees. Like bees are the third most economically important livestock in the entirety of North America and much of the rest of the world. Uh, And it's because these creatures do a lot of incredible things for the environment. Uh, Bees are, uh, it's really interesting that you bring up the fact that bees, ants, and wasps are edible, but in a lot of different countries, they are delicacies. They're something wonderful to consume. Why is it that we are so afraid of consuming insects? 
Ugh. There were multiple researchers and I guess the influencers of their time, the intelligentsia, who were very quick to say that the only individuals who would eat insects are, well, the primitive peoples, the mud races oh. of our world. And so it very much became a thing, especially within uh, Victorian, uh, the Victorian era, to think about the individuals uh, who would eat these kinds of organisms as very primitive. That's for the brown people, but that's not for us. And because... Um, especially in the Western world, a lot of what we have exported has been culture. And we've exported these cultural norms around the world such that a lot of people have taken on this idea that the only individuals who will eat insects are the lower class and uh, the, 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 the just less important human beings of the world. We cool people. We eat larger creatures. We eat cows. We eat chickens. We would never deign to eat something that scuttles on the ground. Wow. Well, so uh, as a as a co-host of a podcast called uh, White Slavery, uh, mm. I'm always interested to hear a new way uh, <laughs> uh, we the people have been oppressed. But uh, I will uh, like just as like a like a counter question. Like I would love it if I was so not uh, squeamish around bugs, and if there was a cockroach in my place, I could just like pop it in my mouth like a quick little like oh cool a treat. I would love that. <laughs> Get uh, but, far. I like I I know a lot of people are are scared of rodents and uh, science was not my forte in school. But Mm -hmm. I I figured that there was some like evolution to be scared of rodents because like you instinctually know they spread disease. Is is there a similar thing with bugs? Because like, why am I like my my girlfriend's a a gardener and like a landscape architect. Mm -hmm. She loves bugs Uh, like she seems very comfortable around them, but but when I see them, and I feel like when most people see them, the instinct is just terror. I fully understand that because I actually was terrified of insects growing up to an extent that, I mean, honestly, people don't fully get it when I say that I was terrified of bugs because they think, oh, yeah, yeah, me too. Every time I see a spider, I'm like, oh, oh my gosh, let's put a bowl over it and take it outside. No, 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 no. When I was a kid, I used to have nightmares on such a regular basis about insects that my father had to come into my room very regularly and step on invisible insects to get me to calm down and go to sleep. So it was a problem. I wasn't trying to go outside for recess. It was all a mess. And then my parents actually decided to solve this problem through knowledge. Uh, They told me that people fear what they don't understand. So as a seven-year-old, they took me to the library. Uh, Armed with a library card, I learned about these creatures and realized, oh, I don't actually need to be afraid of them. They're actually really, really fascinating organisms. Now, I do think that there was some evolutionary element embedded in what was stoking these fears. Because there's something about the way that a spider skitters that immediately catches your eye, no matter where it is in the room, when you see it, you are transfixed. You're like, let me not lose it. Let me catch it under a bowl or let me smush it. Like I cannot go to sleep until I've found this creature. And one of the reasons for this is because way back in the day, when so many of the elements of our structuring as human beings were being embedded into our genetic code, We had to be deftly afraid of these organisms because they we didn't know which ones could cause us ill. We didn't know which ones were the ones that could potentially end our lives. But now I think that we can overcome so much of that because less than one percent of one percent of the bugs on this planet. And I'm going to use bugs loosely the way that they're typically colloquially used. So it's encompassing the spiders and the centipedes and everything else, less than 1% of 1% can cause us any level of harm. But wow. we have decided because we are so frightened of just a few that we're going to allow that few to inform the many. And that's the same way that people, like, I, I was uh, talking to someone about this because uh, I was giving a TED talk and then this guy uh, at the end asked me a question and he says, um, I, I'm, I'm really concerned about insects, but I know I don't need to be concerned about all of them, but because some of them can cause us harm, uh, I just decide to avoid all of them. I decide to behave hostily towards all of them. And I was like, yeah, you do know that that's the same sort of reasoning that people use uh, against black people. They're like, oh, uh, there was this one time where I saw on the news that somebody got mugged by a black person, so I behave with nervousness towards all of them. Or Middle Eastern people. They're like, oh, uh, I don't even know where 
where in the Middle East you come from. I don't need to know any more about you because there's the possibility that uh, something bad could happen. And because I've heard of this before, I've seen someone who looked like you do something problematic. I'm going to code the entire group as problematic. What helps wow. in those contexts is knowledge, understanding this scenario better, understanding the intricacies and details of it, such that you don't have to prejudge the entire population. That's what <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Dr. Sammy, not only was that uh, incredible, but you're like tying in the themes of this film as well, because <laughs> it, you know, you're saying that it has to do with climate change as well. Like if we ate more insects, it would also help our climate, help mm -hmm. the future of humanity. And you're really I, I was trying to remain completely unbiased and let you guys duke it out as far as creepy crawlies are concerned on this podcast. But Truth be told, I've always hated bugs. I hate flying insects. The sound of it makes me crazy. I can look like a maniac on the tennis court, swipe it away. <laughs> uh, that has happened. But you are really changing my, my perspective on it because I don't want to be scared of them, of course. And knowing that such a small percentage of them are out to actually do us harm, uh, I don't know. I think, I've, I think you've got me. <laughs> that did definitely knowing how little of them can harm me did bring the prejudice down a, a little bit. I also yes. I want to say for the record, uh, I, 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 although I, I, I hate being around bugs, I do respect bugs. And I do the one bug I do think is cool uh, insect is like I can read about honeybees for hours. Uh, awesome. Yeah, I knew it. I knew you were going to say that. I that would be my uh, my rich people hobby. I think if I ever got <laughs> super rich, uh, I might try to get some bees going. <laughs> you know, it's it's sad that it works that way, but honestly, it, it tends to be people's rich people hobby now because the more mm. uh, stress factors that we introduce for honeybees, the more work and the more money that it takes to keep them and keep them healthy. So before where there were tons of people all over the U.S. keeping bees, now it's mostly more, uh, oftentimes more affluent individuals, individuals who are already retired and who have money to burn, mm. that kind of thing. <laughs> okay, so if you're listening to this and you're rich and retired and got money to burn, get some bees, help everybody all, all, out. All your friends have a yacht already. Yachts are, none of your <laughs> Yachts are so bears. lame, dude. Get yeah. you an aviary. Dude. Get you a bee yeah. farm. Yeah, unless your yacht is covered in bees. I don't want to see that. <laughs> a bee yacht would be kind of cool. <laughs> that sounds sick. You're going to need to bring a lot of flowers with you on that yacht. Though, yeah. There are no flowers That's even better. It looks better. It smells better. That sounds cool. Um, okay, my my final question, because I, I, we're running out of time, and it really feels like we've been talking for three minutes. You guys are both Doesn't incredible. It it's like, I can't believe this, but it's the easiest podcast of my life. Um, <laughs> as far as these protein powders go, because mm -hmm. I, I know people are, you know, they, they buy these every couple months. And like you said, it seems like there's a new version of it every couple months as well. Is there one specifically, you don't have to say whatever brand or company, mm -hmm. but like is cricket protein the way to go, for example? Should we be looking out for that? Should we be changing? Should we be pivoting to cricket protein? Yeah, what's like, what's the Bitcoin of bugs? Like what yeah, are you exactly. buying now? <laughs> Correct. So, so multiple, there are so many different kinds of insects that will provide you with a great source of protein. The reason why we oftentimes see crickets and mealworms being featured is because they are very easy to raise. We know the exact bioparameters that allow for you to rear them quickly, that allow for you to rear them with, with very little money, and it takes a lot of the guesswork out of the system. If we were to try to add other creatures to this, uh, it can be a bit more difficult because trying to figure out exactly what it is that they need to be happy and healthy and grow as quickly as possible and produce more offspring uh, can be a lot. But there are plenty of insects out there that will provide you good, high quality protein. Uh, the vast majority of them are very, very low in fat, very, very high in protein makes for a great uh, set of food for you to consume. Now, crickets can easily be dried and ground up. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why they also uh, establish a, a great system for protein because you can get rid of all of that excess water and the fluids and things that are inside of them, dry them up, grind them up really fine into a great powder. Uh, do consider though, and this is the most important caveat to my mind. If you are allergic to shellfish, you are very, very, 
very likely allergic to insects because the protein that causes that allergy is chitin. It's the protein that makes up their exoskeleton. It's the same protein that makes up a crab's exoskeleton. And so mm. I was actually, um, I, <laughs> my, <laughs> this is, this is uh, an interesting story, but um, when I graduated, uh, my advisor was actually, uh, <laughs> he, he came to my graduation party. Uh, my parents set out a bowl of bugs and it was just like this this crazy uh, situation where he popped a cricket into his mouth. And I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You can't eat that, can you? Aren't you allergic to shellfish? And he's like, no, no, I, I, I don't think I am. I mean, I might have been when I was a kid, but I ate a soft shell crab recently and nothing happened. So I was good. Oh, no, 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 no. The reason why soft shelled crabs are soft is because the, 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 the matrix of proteins in their exoskeleton hasn't fully come together yet. And so that same set of proteins that you typically can't consume, there might not have been much of it in that soft shell crab. And while I'm saying this, he's like, I might be swelling up a little bit. Oh, no. <laughs> so, you know, crazy situations like that can occur. Um, but uh just all of that to say if you are allergic to shellfish then um you probably don't want to eat cricket powder okay but cr cricket powder is the way of the future and you have a line of cricket powder protein coming out is that correct uh, none of those things are accurate uh okay. it is <laughs> and it is also very important for me to say that uh because i work with the united states department of agriculture i'm not allowed to endorse any particular products and so <laughs> nothing that i've said so far should be taken as an endorsement of any product just, just wait all. he's gonna he's gonna quit and then he's gonna start like an MLM for cricket powder, and then everybody from high school is gonna be hitting you, you up about cricket powder. If you get three of your friends to sell cricket powder, you get a percentage. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right. Well, I, I thank you both once again, seriously, for, for joining me on the podcast, for watching this movie. Um, Murad, you're moving to L.A. Does that mean you have shows coming up in L.A.? Well, Where should people find you, et cetera? Uh, so people can find me uh, on Instagram. It's at Murad Shockey, M-U-R-A-H-D. Uh, we uh, run a bunch of shows up in the Bay Area. It's called Dope Show Bay Area. We run shows uh, at a bunch of different venues, see people on like Comedy Central and Netflix and SF Sketch Fest. Uh, but uh, we're opening, we're going to be starting it uh, in L.A. and Austin soon. So soon Dope Show L.A. and Dope Show Austin will be launching uh, if you follow me on Instagram, you'll also see the at Dope Show Bay Area handle. And uh, we have very, very big things happening uh, before the end of the year. And hopefully it's uh, all going to be uh, ramping up. I also uh, co-host a podcast with the hilarious uh, Kasim Bentley called White Slavery. Uh, hmm. We just had Roy Wood Jr. on. It was a lot of fun. Oh, uh, you guys nice. should uh, check it out. I love Roy Wood Jr. All right. Yeah, it was a good one. That. <laughs> All right. White Slavery. Check out the pod. Uh, thank you, Murad. And Dr. Sammy, anything you want to tell people about? Oh, for sure. Uh, so you guys can follow me on... Oh, wait. No, the first thing I should say is uh, that story that I just told has a happy ending. Um, my I was going to ask if he was killed. I yeah, was going no, to No, he was not killed. Um, he did okay. have to use an EpiPen, but he was fine. But that leaves me uh, constantly trying to remember to tell people like, okay, uh, I do want to endorse the consumption of insects. I think it would be better for the environment. I think it would be a, a good idea for us to consider this. But do keep in mind, if you have allergies to shellfish, it's probably not the best source of food for you uh typically all right so in addition to that if you want to hear more random bug facts uh, i am on twitter uh you can find me at dr sammy tweets d-r-s-a-m-m-y-t-w-e-e-t-s -E -E and at dr sammy grams on instagram you can find me there <laughs> Um, and then if you want to learn more about what the Ramsey Research Foundation is up to, uh, you can check us out at RamseyResearchFoundation.org. Uh, we are working hard to uh, both protect populations of honeybees, better understand how invasive species are introduced into the United States, and also try to uh, reform the structuring of scientific funding because science funding is a broken system that needs to be repaired. And so yep. we've got to start at the bottom and work our way up. Wow. I've Absolutely heard multiple smart people with fancy degrees say the same thing about <laughs> science funding. Yeah. <laughs> 
Let's down fix with that. big science. Wait, no, never mind. Hold <laughs> on, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love science. I just want to see it function more efficiently. And the way that it currently goes about, there is just not a lot of efficiency to the way that uh, a lot of studies are funded and the structuring of how all that goes forward. It just doesn't incentivize the best sorts of um, of, of, of scientific structurings. Yeah, I say let's good, let's just go ahead and replace everyone in Congress and the Senate with scientists. I just feel like that's oh. going to solve a lot of stuff. I don't know. That's an idea. Okay. Okay. Uh, we'll talk I mean, about that. you said it. I didn't say it. Uh, no, but it seemed like you agreed with it. Thank you both for joining me. Uh, this was seriously delightful, and I'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. See you next time.